Thanks a lot. Um, thanks for coming. It's, it's, it's a great pleasure and, and honor to be in the presence of our esteemed guest, uh, Professor um, Dere Kladi, um, who will um, give a talk today on use, use Kogans. Uh, Professor Kladi um, is the special rapporteur for Use Kogans um, um, of the National Law Commission. He studied uh, at the University of Pretoria um, in Connecticut and at the Erasmus University in the Netherlands. He's um, professor of international law at the University of Pretoria, an extraordinary professor at the University of Stellenbosch. He has a couple of um, um, in numerous um, positions as advisor, counselor, legal counselor um, to the South African mission to the United Nations. He's, of course, a member of the International Law Commission. Um, he's published extensively on international law. Um, his book, Sustainable Development in International um, Law, is to be mentioned. And qu quite, um, I was quite surprised to find out and, and um, um, I'm going to have a look at also uh, uh, Professor Kladi's novel, um, uh, which is called um, Blood in the Sand of Justice, which, as I've seen, has received quite favorable reviews online. So that's clearly um, a book to have a look at as well. So um, without further ado, let me hand over to Professor um, um, Kladi. Afterwards, we're going to have a couple of questions. I think Professor Kladi will speak for roughly half an hour, and then we're going to hear comments from, 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 from our other panelists. Thanks a lot. Well, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be back here. I was here on another panel just uh, three months ago, I think. Um, it was a very interesting panel on the SADC Tribunal, a very robust discussion, and subsequently there was even talks about lawsuits, so it was really a very um, <laughs> exciting discussion. I hope that this this discussion will be as interesting, but not uh, <laughs> sufficient enough to, to raise possibilities of lawsuits. Um, so I've been asked to, to say something about Jus um, in, in my capacity as um, the special rapporteur, having, having uh, not yet completed, but almost completed my first report um, on Jus Kogens. Um, I suspect, is known to all of you, but perhaps for the uninitiated, it refers to um, superior norms of international law, if one can um, um, explain it in that way. Um, one famous international law professor has um, famously observed that Euskogans has the abbreviations JC. Um, and there was another fellow very long ago who could walk on water, could turn water into wine, who also had um, the initials JC. Um, and I think this is suggesting something about the power of use Kogans um, um, and the impact that, um, that potentially it could have. Um, some of the other terms that are used to refer to use Kogans, peremptory norms, binding law, um, uh, necessary law, um, but of course, in a sense, all international law is binding, and all international law, in a sense, is peremptory because, well, you have to comply with it, right? Um, so, so in some sense, one might say, well, these these phrases that are used to describe use Kogans uh, might not add much to the debate or the doctrinal debate um, of use Kogans, but in fact, they. They do reflect something. I think they do um, um, illustrate the almost counterintuitive character of use Kogans in international law. It's easy to understand and to explain um, ideas about use Kogans in domestic law, but it's different um, in international law. It's almost counterintuitive to have idea of superior rules, rules from which no derogation is permissible, um, in a legal system that's um, horizontal is really difficult to explain. Um, if you think of, of, of international law as law that is made by the subjects, right, whereas in domestic law there is an authority that makes law, um, it, it becomes difficult to explain then how the same subjects that make law cannot derogate from it. Um, and that's, I guess, why most of international law is what we would call use dispositive. Note, 
not JC, but JD, right? So it's one, um, one alphabet letter removed from that <laughs> miraculous JC. Um, so these kind of rules are rules, of course, that, uh, that states can freely derogate from, uh, amend, uh, abolish by means of an agreement. Um, whereas use Kogan's exceptionally, states are not able to do this. Um, it's very difficult to pinpoint exactly at what point use Kogan's, in international law at least, um, became acceptable. I mean, if one looks at the history um, of the evolution of use Kogan's, one finds that it is rather obscure. The only thing that is absolutely clear is that it's, um, um, it's coming out party, if you like, um, was made possible by the work of the International Law, Con the work of the International Law Commission um, in the, uh, the adoption of the draft articles on the Law of Treaties and subsequently um, the adoption by states at the Vienna Conference of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties based on the work of the Commission. Um, it's worthwhile to, to quote from Article 53 of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. Um, it provides a treaty is void if at the time of its conclusion it conflicts with a peremptory norm of general international law and then defines a peremptory norm of general international law for the purposes of the treaty as a norm accepted and recognized by the international community of states as a whole from which no, no derogation is permitted and which can be modified only by a subsequent norm of general international law having the same character. Now, this particular provision, of course, is a mirror image with some slight but very important modifications from the text that was produced by the, the International Law Commission in its draft articles on the law of treaties. Um, now, in adopting this particular provision, um, the Commission made uh, an important comment to explain why it hadn't given more flesh <coughs> to um, the draft Article 50. I um, mean, the Commission said, and I quote here, that the emergence of rules having the character of use Kogan's is comparatively recent while international law is in the process of rapid development. The Commission considered the right course to be to provide in general terms that a treaty is void if it conflicts with a rule of use Kogan's and to leave the full content of the rule to be worked out in state practice and in the ju jurisprudence of international tribunal. Now, since the adoption in 1966 of the draft articles uh, on the law of treaties and 1969 um, um, of the Vienna Convention on the law of treaties, um, there has been some, in fact, no, I think it would be wrong to say there has been some practice. There has been a lot of practice. Um, but this practice has been rather um, uneven and unsystematic. In fact, what one can say is that there hasn't been an um, authoritative systematization of the rules relating to use Kogan's. <coughs> What we have had in abundance um, has been literature, and li literature that is um, widely differing as far as um, um, the, um, uh, the perceptions of the content, uh, the reach, the impact, the consequences um, um, of the rules relating to use Kogan's. So for some, use Kogan's is nothing more than just rules which and this is important for parties to the Vienna Convention and subject to the dispute settlement provision which is linked to use Kogan's in the Vienna Convention on the, on the Law of Treaties may invalidate treaties. I mean, in other words, for these authors, use Kogan's is nothing more than the application of a treaty rule. And if you think about use Kogan's in that sense, then it's not really uh, one from which no derogation is permissible because presumably as a treaty rule, um, state parties to the Vienna Convention can abolish that rule, can deviate from him by amending the Vienna Convention or whatever the case may be. Um, I mean, so that's an interesting dynamic. If one restricts use Kogan's to um, its application, I mean, the context of the Vienna Convention. For others still, it is, and again, this is another limited view of use Kogan's, it is simply a legal technique um, so it's not so much about the rules, it's more a technique for avoiding conflict between various rules um, and for avoiding fragmentation of the international legal system. So it's nothing more than, say, for example, um, the legal technique of lex specialis, um, right? So, so, so there isn't anything special and it's not about superiority. It's just simply a legal technique amongst many other techniques that um, 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 interpreters of international law can use to sort of avoid conflict. Yet for others, 
um, Yuskogans, JC, reminds them of that man who could walk on water, right? It is a special source of law um, whose reach and power um, is almost all consuming, right? And so it can do all things. Um, if you're faced with any question, the right answer is always <coughs> dependent on what Yus Kogan says about it, right? Um, now, the lack of an authoritative statement on Yus Kogan's, um, coupled with, uh, with um, uh, these widely varying uh, writings on Yus Kogan's, um, has in fact had the effect of diminishing the potential impact that Yus Kogan's can actually have in international law. Um, Ian Brownlee has, in this context, uh, famously described Yus Kogan's as a car that is parked in a garage and simply doesn't move and simply never moves. Um, in, in making the case for the International Law Commission to undertake a study on Yus Kogan's, I took this um, analogy of, um, of uh, Ian Brownlee and I sort of expanded a little bit on it and said it's not just a car, right? It's, it's a special kind of a car. It's a, it's a Buick, a Maybach, or whatever it is. And it's parked in a garage, not able to move for a very particular reason. It doesn't have a wheel. And so the idea was to propose a topic, use Kogan's, in order to give the Buick the Maybach, the Mercedes-Benz, whatever it is that you like, um, a wheel so that it can go out into the world um, and experience the world, but more importantly, that the world can experience use Kogan, right? So that it can actually have some real impact um, beyond the things that we write about in literature. Um, so I proposed a topic, um, and in the proposal, I, I, I suggested that the commission could look at four things, or four aspects of um, um, of the topic, the first being the nature of use Kogan's, um, and the second, which is very closely linked to the first one, <coughs> being the requirements or the criteria for identifying when a particular rule norm qualifies as use Kogan's, um, and the third one, proposing that the Commission might look at um, having an illustrative list <coughs> of norms um, that have already met the, the requirements um, um, or, that it would have been identified by the commission. Um, and then finally, that the commission would then look at um, the consequences or effects once a particular norm has been identified as a norm of use Kogan's. Um, yeah. Now, this was proposed in 2013, and needless to say, um, it caused quite a bit of a stir within the commission because um, the topic of use Kogan's is a special topic, um, and some purists are, the, are rather reluctant that it be touched. Um, there were, I would say, three categories of objections that were raised about, um, about the, uh, the introduction of the topic, and I think I'll say a couple of things about them because it's one of those things which you will not find in any documents since these discussions were held in closed doors. Um, I cannot, I wish I could, but I cannot share with you which member of the commission held which view. Um, that's the lawsuit concern. That's exactly well. <laughs> uh, the, the, the one concern, which I must admit I myself also shared and so was a bit reluctant to propose a topic precisely because of this, was that, well, there is something special about Hughes Kogan's, um, and it's one of those topics which, um, as one member said, should be above the glass ceiling for the commission. Um, and the fear here is that, um, the commission could do some damage to this concept if not handled appropriately. So, so that's the one concern. Um, the second concern that was raised, which is a little more substantive, um, was that in fact if one looks at the period between 1969 and where we are right now, um, there hasn't been much practice to give further content to use Kogan's, particularly with respect to what would be the most important aspect of the, the topic, namely the criteria, right? Beyond what the Vienna Convention says, what is it in practice um, that we could find that would help us give content to um, use Kogan's and the criteria? And these members of the commission essentially said, well, there is nothing, right? And so the, idea, the, the uh, result then is that if the commission decided to undertake this topic, um, there would be great disappointment because uh, we would either simply 
recite what was already in the Vienna Convention, or we would um, say things that were not based on and that were not supported by practice. Well, um, I think that this particular criticism um, is quite simply wrong, but um, in any event, that was a criticism that was raised. The final criticism um, related to um, the issue of the consequences, which would be another issue that would be at the heart of this topic. I mean, I think it's one of those issues that that um, that um, um, the international community, and by international community, I mean people interested in the subject of Euskogans, um, um, would be interested in, and that's the consequences of Euskogans or the effect of Euskogans. Um, the fear that was expressed here was more of a political dynamic. Uh, Concern that if one looks at the if one looks at the um, the composition of the commission, um, it's unlikely that the current composition of the commission um, would be able to find agreement on the consequences of Euskogans. Um, essentially, what that view that was being expressed was was we have all very different ideas. There are some within the commission that think that use Corgans is JC. Um, and there are others in the commission that, say, that think that it's just simply a technique, right? And so um, notwithstanding <coughs> the fact that there's a special rapporteur, ultimately, the text that's going to be adopted by the commission has to be the text of the commission as a whole. And if it's not possible to find agreement, then um, perhaps we should not undertake um, the topic. In any event, after much discussion, um, the Commission finally decided last year that it would include the topic on its current program of work um, and to appoint me a special rapporteur for the topic. And in May or July of this year, the, the, the Law Commission would consider the first report, which I, um, as I've said, is in a draft phase. <clears throat> So the main purpose of the report um, was really just to sort of set out um, overarching conceptual ideas about what use Kogans is. Um, I, I, I confess I was mindful about doing too much in this first report um, in the light of the fact that it might be my last year on the commission because we do have elections later on this year. And I wouldn't want to... Um, to um, tie in whoever else might take over the topic in the future. So I was cautious not to go too far. Um, and so the report really tries to, to, to set out issues that I hope should be uncontroversial. Um, the second purpose of the report, all, um, the report also addresses a number of um, methodological issues that I think would affect how the, the topic is carried out um, in the future. And then finally, on the basis of the analysis, the report proposes three draft conclusions which I thought were fairly uncontroversial until I shared them with some of the, uh, uh, my colleagues on the commission. Um, and surprisingly, they had uh, a number of um, concerns. Um, um, uh, I'm event. So I'll just mention just a couple of the uh, methodological issues before I get into the uh, a few things about the substance of the report. Um, the first issue that, that I've had to think quite a little bit about is the sequencing of these various issues that are going to be addressed. So the nature, the criteria, the illustrative list, and the consequences. Because in a sense, each one influences um, the other. Um, and one of the things that I had thought um, that I might do with this topic is simply to do a number of reports without proposing any draft conclusions and then at the end, on the basis of all of them, simply present a set of draft conclusions. Um, in the end, I decided that it was actually useful to get, as you go along, comments on particular draft conclusions that you're thinking about. Um, and so, so I think, well, not I think, I've pretty much decided that, uh, that um, uh, the sequencing will have to be handled with some kind of flexibility. So in a sense, um, I will address the topics in the order in which they come. So I will start, as I did in this first report, with the nature. Um, and, and in the second report, I would look at the criteria, um, and then question mark about the third report, and so on, with the understanding that I will always be able to go back, and that the commission itself will be able to go back um, and look at uh, the conclusions to see if um, yeah. um, 
um, to see if any amendments need to be made. The second methodological issue concerned um, the materials to be used, and in particular whether or not um, the topic will be undertaken by a study of the literature, um, or whether or, um, the commission and the special rapporteur would limit him or herself to state practice um, or to judicial practice. And in a sense, um, my view of this, and this is the view that's reflected in the report, is that there is nothing um, that requires that this particular topic be handled in a way that's different from the way we handle any other topic. So we should handle it in the same way that we handle any other topic, um, which means that you use all the material available, and that includes practice of states as we define it. Um, and it's not only practice on the ground as one um, um, uh, um, as one individual has suggested, but it includes statements by states, right? So those are th th those also constitute practice. Um, but also, of course, judicial decisions, um, but uh, um, the writings of authors um, will be important. The final um, methodological issue that I just want to very quickly touch on relates to the illustrative list, which is um, it's funny, once the Law Commission decided to place this topic on the agenda, I received many letters from many interest groups saying that their particular <laughs> issue is Euskogans. So environmental groups wrote saying, by the way, don't forget the protection of the environment is Euskogans, um, and so on and so on. Um, so, so, so obviously, a lot of people are waiting for this illustrative list with the hope that their issue um, will be reflected in this illustrative list. Um, I. In the first report, uh, you will see when you do get it, um, I express a bit of hesitance about whether or not I should continue with um, the illustrative list and whether the commission should in fact include an illustrative list. There are a number of reasons. Um, some members of the commission and indeed some states um, in commenting on the ILC's decision to place a topic on its agenda um, had queried uh, whether or not having an illustrative list, even if we very carefully explain that it's only illustrative, would not have the effect of sort of freezing the development where anything that's not on the list, on this illustrative list, um, will immediately be regarded as not a norm of use Kogans because it is not on the list. Um, I have to say that I myself have never been convinced by this particular argument, um, simply because I think that is the risk you run whenever you put anything on text. And so the, the only responsibility for the authors of a text must be to clearly <coughs> explain what it is that they mean. Um, um, on the other hand, I do think that the idea of an illustrative list does raise the question about the nature of the topic and the nature of the project. I think the nature of the topic or project is more about identification rather than substantive rules. I mean, if you are going to, for example, make the claim that um, genocide, uh, and I pick the most non-controversial example, is a norm of use Kogans, presumably it would require that you engage in a study of genocide. Right, of the rules relating to genocide, um, which somehow goes beyond the nature of this topic um, as a topic that's sort of more, more about the approach rather than about um, substantive issues. So I'm, I'm, um, I'm considering the issue of this, the, the illustrative list, and of course, um, um, the report poses the question whether member states and members of the commission um, uh, are of the view that we should continue with the idea of an illustrative list. The report itself sketches um, the evolution of use Kogans, um, and to save time, I'm just going to sort of share with you a couple of general conclusions that I drew from the historical assessment or historical um, overview of the evolution of use Kogans. Um, uh, the first, and again, this shouldn't be very controversial, is that use Kogans has its ro roots in natural law thinking, right? So higher law, immutable law, independent of the will of state, and so on. Um, the second general conclusion, which of course is directly linked to this, is that it's therefore not surprising that in the 17th and 18th century, um, international law writers embraced the idea of non-derogable rules, very similar to use Kogans, even though not using the phrase use Kogans. Um, the third general conclusion is that the dominance of positivism in the 19th and 20th century saw the <coughs> decline of the idea of immutable legal rules in international law. Um, the fourth conclusion, and this is, I think, the most su surprising 
at least for me, conclusion in the historical analysis, um, is that the idea of international law from which no derogation was permitted, even during the height of positivism, um, remained common amongst authors and writers. Um, in fact, it was, it seems, accepted pretty much by all authors except um, the most radical of positivists. The, the explanations for why in a positive law thinking, something like Euskogans or something like non-derogable rights uh, or non-derogable rules was possible varied amongst writers. For example, um, Georg Jelinek um, bases his positivist I idea or understanding of non-derogable international law rules on um, possibility of performance, right? So if it's immoral, then it's impossible as a legal matter to perform that obligation. Now, it may not be a particularly convincing argument, but, but here was a writer steeped in a positivist tradition who accepts the idea of of, of invalidity of treaties on the basis of morality. Um, um, Nippold recognizes immoral treaties, but he uses a very strong positivist idea to say, well, uh, immoral treaties have in any event been outlawed in previous treaties, right? So to the extent that they've been outlawed in previous treaties, then um, uh, uh, um, and the conclusion of such a treaty would be um, invalid. Um, so, 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 so you had a number of these, uh, these explanations to explain why positivism uh, would, <coughs> would accept or recognize um, non-derogable rules. Um, the fifth general conclusion is that actual practice of states before the end of the Second World War um, is very thin. Um, and in fact, the little practice that exists, it's not really use Kogans, right? It's sort, of, it's sort of treaty provisions that provide that in the future you may not derogate from this provision. Right? Um, so that's not use Kogans in the sense that, that we know it. I mean, an example of this, of course, is um, Article 20 of the Covenant of the League of Nations. Um, the sixth and the final general conclusion that one can draw from the historical analysis is that the work of the commission, and importantly, the responses by states to the work of the commission, had the effect of shifting Euskogans from just uh, uh, writings to actual practice. And so in that sense, then, the work of the commission um, and the responses of, of states was extremely important. And it's worth saying a couple of things about it. The term Euskogans first appears in the work of the Commission on the Law of Treaties in the work Sorry, in the eighth report, in the eighth overall report um, on the law of treaties, and it was a third report of Fitzmaurice. Um, but the idea of invalidity of treaties on the basis of some general rules um, appeared in the fourth overall report and the first report of Lauterpach. What's very interesting is that if you look at the debates of the Commission on this particular question, you find it would be an understatement to say overwhelming support. Because not a single member of the commission in the time that this issue was discussed um, objected or raised concerns about the principle itself. There were certainly questions about the theoretical basis, um, examples, the, 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 um, uh, the criteria, but the principle itself um, was not questioned. Um, also, and this is very important, states in their comments on the work of the commission generally welcomed um, the inclusion of um, this provision. Uh, interestingly, only one state um, expressed reservation about the principle itself. And that state is not, as many would think, France, but Luxembourg. Right? It was only Luxembourg that said, we do not think that as a matter of international law as it stands today, there is such a thing as Euskogans. Now, other states may have expressed some words of caution. The United Kingdom, for example, um, accepted the principle, but cautioned that it, it could only apply in very limited instances, but the principle itself um, was not um, um, objected to. Um, a similar trend of support for the idea, the principle of use organs, can be seen in 
um, the negotiations of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties based on this text. Again, I refer to France um, because it is often uh, put forward as an example of a state which to this day rejects the idea of use corgans. But certainly in the course of negotiating the Vienna Convention, France didn't reject the idea. Uh, the delegate of France um, explaining the, the concerns that France had um, um, stated that France could hardly formulate an objection to such a principle. <clears throat> The concern that France had, and which was shared by the United States and the United Kingdom, was that it was important for the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, if you're going to include a provision like this, to also have the criteria, right? To spell out very clearly the criteria, um, or to have a list of the rules that qualifies use Kogans, because the fear of France was that um, it would be very dangerous for the legal system if any state could subsequently unilaterally decide that a particular treaty that, they'd ha that they had concluded was use cogens and therefore invalid. In other words, it would be an excuse to, to, um, to um, uh, not to comply with treaty obligations. Um, I mean, of course, this particular concern is addressed in the Vienna Convention by, um, uh, by Article 66, which provides for a compulsory dispute settlement mechanism in the case where a, a party wants to um, uh, declare a particular treaty invalid on account of, of uh, use Kogans. So I think it can, it, can, um, it, it can be definitively stated that certainly by the conclusion of the Vienna uh, conference in 1969 and the adoption of the convention, um, use Kogans was firmly established um, in international law. Um, and certainly since then, there has, as I mentioned at the very beginning, um, been a steady amount of practice um, which has had the effect of entrenching it further. So it's been referred to positively um, in the jurisprudence of international courts. Um, overall, in 90 judgments and or individual opinions of the International Court of Justice, there has been a positive response or a, a positive reference to use Corgans. Um, it has been, and this of course excludes um, um, some other international courts and tribunals. Um, it has been obviously extensively referred to in domestic jurisprudence. Um, most recently, yesterday, in, by the Supreme Court of Appeal in South Africa in the case relating to uh, the Sudanese president. Um, and of course, consistently states refer to Yuskogans in their statements before various organs of the United Nations. Um, the report then addresses um, the question of the philosophical basis, the theoretical basis of Yuskogans. And I know this is a, um, um, a subject that um, might be of interest to, to, to um, the panel, and I <coughs> suspect that there'll be a lot of discussion on it. So I'll only say a few things about what the report does with this very um, important question. Um, first, the report concludes that it is essentially unnecessary to resolve this issue, although it is important. And one of the reasons for this is that if one looks at the jurisprudence of the various international courts and tribunals, you find um, um, an equal reliance on both of the dominant theories um, on use Kogans. Um, the, the, um, the other conclusion um, um, in the report is that none of these two dominant theories are on their own sufficient to explain the nature or um, the peremptory nature in any event of rules of use Kogans. So I, I uh, the report um, describes the dominant theories, um, it describes the flaws, um, but ultimately does not offer a, uh, a view as to which one is, is um, uh, the appropriate one. Um, finally, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, the report uh, on the basis of the analysis of the, uh, the court decisions and the practice um, offers a three draft conclusions, um, and I'll just read them out very quickly. 
Um, well, the first one is not really a draft conclusion. It's not a substantive draft conclusion. It's just simply a scope provision, so I won't read that one. Um, draft conclusion two has two paragraphs. Um, and the first paragraph uh, provides that rules of international law may be modified, derogated from, or abrogated by agreement of states to which the rule is applicable unless such modification, derogation, or abrogation is prohibited by the rule in question. So that's the JD, right? The use dispositive rule. Um, then it continues the, um, the derogation and abrogation can take place through treaty, custom international law, or other agreements. Um, the second paragraph um, then states that an exception to the rule set forth in paragraph one is peremptory norms of general international law which may only be modified, derogated from, or abrogated by rules having the same character. <coughs> This then takes us to draft conclusion three, um, which is titled The General Nature of Use Corgans. Um, and the first paragraph provides that peremptory norms of international law, use Corgans, are those norms of general international law accepted and recognized by the international community of states as a whole as those from which no modification, derogation, or abrogation is permitted. This essentially uses the, what we find in the Vienna Convention with slight modifications. Um, the second paragraph, which is the one that it has elicited the most comments from my colleagues on the commission, um, is or reads, norms of use Kogans protect the fundamental values of the international community, are hierarchically superior to other norms of international law, and are universally applicable. Um, and I will stop there. Thanks a lot. Um, th th thanks a lot for the, for the talk. Before I hand over to, um, for the first comment to Professor Karen, let me tell you that I've been terribly remiss and I've um, kept from you an important word, and it's a hashtag, and that's use Kogan's YTL. So those of you who, who, who are Twitter writers and want to tweet about these events, please use the hashtag use Kogan's YTL. In one, um, um, in one go. And I'm going to hand over immediately um, to Professor Karen, who's judge with the Iran United States uh, Claims Tribunal in The Hague, and of course, professor of international law here at King's College. And he's also the colleague formerly known as our dean, um, <laughs> or, or as we find out just now, the, the ex-dean. Ex um, and and uh, without further ado, may I hand over to Professor Karen. Uh, thank you very much. The, um, <clears throat> so first I want to tell you that uh, Didier was very kind to share his draft first report with us. So the three commentators have the benefit of that, and I'll try to fill in as I go along. My congratulations to him on the report. Uh, as an international law professor, you read lots of exams in international law, and there's a certain point when the student has painted themselves into a corner on the exam, or they don't know the way out of the room. And at that point, they refer to use Kogan's <laughs> and blast their way out of the room. Uh, it's not a very satisfactory answer, actually, given how rare the chances are that you could actually use use Kogan's uh, in that way. My comments follow the structure of the report he has shared. And um, in part, one thing I'm going to emphasize uh, that may not be clear to everyone is the institutional context that this is in. Uh, and the method that's being used and why that's thought about. Um, and then I have some comments about the substance at the end. Um, as far as the evolution of the topic for the ILC, uh, I would say, you know, the U.S. is leery <coughs> of the ILC. I've served on the advisory committee for the State Department in the U.S. It's independent for about uh, 15 years. And I've saw a number of conversations where should we oppose this topic going? And it, the basic position would be um, we're supportive of the idea of use Kogan's. It's uh, not a Buick in the garage. It's a Buick in the garage that has a nuclear weapon on top. And you know, actually, we want it parked in the garage most of the time. And the idea that someone's going to enable this Buick to be driven out to have more impact. Uh, and we don't know really who that person is. And they're going to get letters from, be bombarded with letters from various organizations. Well, that's a little dicey. And so how do we think about that? So you might think they are a little leery. And that leads to why they then start harping on method. They start saying, well, what materials are you going to look to? Um, and look to state practice. 
because actually that's the most important. And I'll come back to that in a moment. I would also say, um, Deary points out that in thinking about the topic, they had uh, 48 states comment on the idea. And that is unusual. That may seem like a low number. That's actually a high number. Uh, very rarely do the states comment on the ILC work. Uh, and you will have the surprising uh, interaction where you'll find a junior lawyer in the foreign ministry has been asked, oh, by the way, could you comment on this draft that's come out? And so uh, what that evidence is to me is in part there are a number of states, A, that think it's important, or B, it evidences that they are receiving letters saying, we really think you should get in on this topic and that it's important you comment on this topic. Uh, from various non-governmental uh, organizations. I agree entirely with um, Dire putting front and center in the beginning of his report that this is not about resolving theoretical disputes, although they have to be understood. Rather, it's about, and I'll quote, uh, providing a set of conclusions that reflect the current state of international law relating to use Kogans. And there are two th very important things buried in there. One, unlike the earlier Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, they're not doing draft articles, which are then changed by governments. This whole method of working has shifted with the ILC. If they produce conclusions, well, conclusions are their conclusions. And in a soft law way, they just come out and have force. It's not that they then are somehow changed by states and modified. Secondly, the current state. And I would say, dear, you're going to have a tough time because normally the mandate of the ILC is to talk about codification, which is current state, and progressive development. And the ILC avoids the argument in every utterance, well, is that codification or is that progressive development, by saying, let's talk about that at the end. <laughs> and they just go ahead. Now, in this case, there could be a constant discussion about, well, no, no, stop. Don't talk about that, because that's actually progressive development. We want, we're talking about what's currently the law regarding Yuskogitz. And to the extent we see that, I would say that is a different way. There's an effort to try and discipline the ILC in approaching this topic. They want them to focus on that. On method, uh, Deary in the report stresses he's flexible and fluid. And I'd say that's a wise tactic. Um, <laughs> But I'm reminded of a treaty negotiator I knew who said, um, you know, at the beginning of the negotiations, it's like clay on a wheel, and you're shaping it, and God, flexible and fluid, and all of a sudden you find it's drying. And, oh, I can't get rid of that bulge anymore. Um, <laughs> and so I'm sure you're aware of this, but it's, it's tricky to move that forward. Um, Dire uh, asks uh, specifically here, moving from the illustrative list to the idea that, well, maybe there'll be an annex that summarizes all the examples we necessarily have to talk about in order to understand the abstract. And I think that's uh, right, that you'll have to talk about examples. Um, the one thing I would say from the scholarly side is that annex will exist regardless of what the commission does. Someone is going to discuss every example you put out. Um, and the Commission probably will want an annex, if for no other reason than to understand what they've said <laughs> thus far. Um, touch briefly on the historical evolution. I would recommend it to all of you when this becomes public. It's uh, a wonderful document. I think one footnote to me is a criticism of legal scholarship today. Uh, it refers to the first, and it's not a criticism of you, Derry, uh, it's of the scholar. Uh, one scholar used Lexis to find the first time the phrase arose, um, which is interesting. But of course, in terms of intellectual history, the question is when did non-derogable norms yes. first arise? Yes. Not that phrase, per se. And um, the one thing I think you're missing is you could look at Judge Consade's separate opinion <coughs> in um, the Pulp Mills case. Because during the commission of jurists in around 1930, there was a discussion of sources and what are the general principles of law. It ends up not being a very powerful source, a really subsidiary source, but the undercurrent was essentially use Kogan's. They wanted general principles to be 
uh, something extremely strong, non-derogable, the, the natural law that recurs everywhere. The, um, so finally, just a couple comments about legal nature of use Kogans. Um, Deere tries to show this, how the natural law might conceive of this, the JC, and then the uh, positivists, how they might conceive of it. So the only thing I would add, and I think it's implicit in a number of quotes you have, is, um, and it comes back importantly to method, is you can think of the phrase um, accepted and recognized by the international community of states as a whole as something non-derogable. You can accept, look at that phrase as a rule of recognition. It is positivist in that it gives states the choice. But what it strikes me as is what it's doing is saying states identify what is so fundamental, what is, you could say, natural in that way, in the sense that I don't think states, what ends up being fundamental is what they cannot deny publicly. Um, there are, states should not like use Kogan's. In, in just sort of a rational actor way. It's a limiting factor, why would they want that? But I think there are certain things they publicly could just not say, um, okay, we, that, that's, uh, that has to be immutable, right? So I, I think that's one thing to uh, think about there. What I would say is the difficult part for me about the Vienna Convention is the last phrase, which you repeat uh, in various ways. From which no derogation is permitted and which can be modified only by a subsequent norm of a general international, of general international law having the same character. And what troubles about me, me about that is that is particularly natural law to me. Um, why couldn't the states come together and say and declare, accept and declare, it's no longer use Kogan's? If it was really positivist, they could just turn it off. Well, we thought piracy was. Uh, a norm from which you can't derogate, but actually thinking about it, maybe there are exceptions. <clears throat> and that last one's troubling because you constantly talk about when can the norm elevate? You never ask whether it can be put back down. Um, and it's an interesting question to me. It's, it's inherently, you know, we finally discovered it, it must be immutable. Um, and it's just a question in the background, but it, you are following 53 in that way. And finally, I just have a brief uh, comment on the core elements uh, that you identify, Dere. And you identify three in Article 53, and then, as you said, you identify three from doctrine and practice. And you could say the three plus three, right? Um, this, to me, is a method question. You, you say the materials, we will someday, in time, we let all the materials in, and we will decide what is the appropriate weight. In the arbitration world, that is a standard answer we give when someone tries to exclude a piece of evidence. The tribunal will decide its evidentiary weight. But there is actually a very difficult discussion to go through about what is the weight you give something. And what strikes me is in doing that, you actually have given weight to a lot of material to do that. The only state practice, the really key state practice we have is Article 53 their agreement to those to that. The others, there is some state practice in there, but if you, if you thought that is not a rule of recognition, but the rule of recognition in Article 53, then you have to look for the community of states to accept and recognize. The last thing I would say just on the elements is I would suggest you talk about what is not an element of use Kogan's. And in particular, a number of scholars will talk about Yuskogans as super custom, which I think is quite inaccurate in the sense that there is no requirement of practice. Um, what, is, what is important is that the states say that it is non-derogable. They may admit their failings. We know there is slavery in the world. We know there's torture in the world. Um, we know there's aggression. But this is what we hold to be non-derogable even though we fail. And to me, that's a very crucial difference between the two types of norms. So thank you, and thank you for the report.
Um, thanks a lot. Now over to Professor John Tesoulis, who is the inaugural chair of politics, philosophy and law here at King's College and the director of the Yeo Tiang Lei Center for Politics, Philosophy and Law. John. Thanks so much, Christoph. It's a great privilege and a pleasure to be commenting on this report. As David indicated, it's very learned about the history and the doctrine of Jus Kogens. It has a very crystal clear conceptual structure to it. And most um, um, enticingly of all for a philosopher, it engages some theoretical issues. So it's those theoretical issues that I want to discuss. Now the report exhibits what in general um, seems a healthy attitude towards the role of theory in thinking about Muskogans, and it's a prudently ambivalent attitude. On the one hand, Deary says that the theoretical debate concerning the foundations of Muskogans <coughs> cannot be avoided. We will not, at the very least, understand many assertions about Muskogans unless we grasp how they draw on background theories. On the other hand, Deary says that it's not necessary for this project to resolve the theoretical dispute. That is also true, and perhaps just as well, because the number of philosophical disputes that have been resolved in the history of the subject approximates to zero. So what is this theoretical debate that we have to engage in but not necessarily resolve? Well, it's the standoff all too familiar from your jurisprudence one course between natural law theory and legal positivism, the perpetual World Cup final of legal philosophy. Now, before we get onto what these theories say, it's useful to distinguish two questions to which they might be taken to offer answers. The first question is a question about the legitimacy of law. The question, given that X is a valid law, is there a moral obligation to obey it? The second question is the prior question about the nature of law. What is law? How do we identify the existence and content of valid law in the first place? Now, although there's some ambiguity in the report about this, I think the main concern in talking about theoretical foundations is with the second question, the question of the nature of law in general and how this bears on the nature of Jus Kogens. So how does the report understand the natural law and legal positive stances to the question of the nature of law? So according to the report, the natural lawyer is presented as grounding Jus Kogens in principles of natural law. And this is, I quote, the idea of superior law, which is based on morality and values. These natural law principles are not only superior and moral, but also, according to the report, immutable. They never change, despite changes in social circumstances, practices, and beliefs. Now, by contrast, according to the legal positivist view, law, including Jus Kogens norms, is a product not of objective and immutable moral principles, but of the historical fact of state consent. Now, having set up these two main theoretical options in this way, the report proceeds to tear them to shreds. So let me mention two criticisms that the report makes against the natural law view. The first objection is that it doesn't follow from the fact that a principle is morally sound, that it is therefore a legal principle. You can't simply derive international law or any positive law solely from abstract moral reflection, no matter how sound it is. As the Vienna Convention says, Jus Kogan's principles must be recognized by the international community of states. Being morally sound is not enough and may not even be necessary for the status of law. The social fact of recognition is, however, necessary to distinguish positive law from objectively sound morality. So that's one criticism. The second criticism is that the immutability of natural law principles is, com is incompatible with the fact that use cogens can change over time. So here I read the report differently from David. Whereas the prohibition of slavery, for example, is an immutable natural law principle, true from the beginning of time, the legal prohibition of slavery under use cogens is not. International law did not always contain a prohibition against slavery or genocide or aggressive war for that matter. Again, contrary to the claims of immutability, the Vienna Convention recognizes that new peremptory norms may emerge over time, according to the report. Now, both of these criticisms seem to me to be devastating to the natural law approach as defined. <coughs> but the critique of the legal positivist approach to use Kogens is, if anything, even more devastating. So according to the positivist view, and I'm quoting now from the report, 
positive law at its purest is based on the idea of the free will of states and that it is only through consent that international law is made. States cannot be bound by rules to which they have not consented. And the report then proceeds to carry out an elegant hit job on consent obsessed positivist analyses of Juskogens. After all, how can a positivist give an account of Juskogens when it looks like the very nature of Juskogens norms is that they bind a state independently of whether or not it has consented to them? So two theoretical options have been set up, and within the space of a few paragraphs, both stand utterly discredited as explanations of the nature of Juskogens. Now, I agree that the views in question are abysmal failures, but I want to suggest that the victory over them is so easy that it should perhaps make us a little uneasy. Maybe both legal positivism and natural law were formulated in a way that was destined to fail. Both theoretical options on this view are confusions. They are the Scylla and Charybdis that we are to steer clear from on our journey to the safe harbor of Euskogens. But maybe more charitable and illuminating interpretations of natural law and legal positivism are available. Interpretations according to which they actually help point in a positive way in the direction <coughs> to which we need to travel. So let's begin with legal positivism, the biggest casualty of the report. <laughs> Legal positivism is an account of the nature of law in general, not just international law or use cogens. As its name indicates, its central thesis is that the law is posited, that it is a human creation. Consent may be one way of creating law, but it's not the only way. We see this in the case of domestic legal systems that are not in any way plausibly based on consent of those governed. Now, precisely the posited character of law was what the report appealed to in its first objection to natural law theory. So rather than discarding legal positivism on the basis that it makes the law the product of consent, the report could have adopted a different approach. It could have said that there is a positivist constraint on anything, including Juskogens, being law. This is the constraint that it must be the product of human activity, a social creation, not necessarily a product of consent, though that might be the explanation for treaty-based law. We then carry forward a theoretical insight that will shape and inform the rest of the discussion. Now, obviously, this salvage operation of legal positivism leaves open lots of questions. Law may be a human creation, but in what way? And is it exclusively a product of social fact? I leave these profound questions aside. Consider now the natural law view. Would a more sympathetic Treatment of natural law also salvage some valuable insights for the analysis of use cogens? I think the answer is yes. But first, as with positivism, we need a more charitable interpretation of natural law. Now, historically, I think natural law involves two independent claims. The first claim is that there are objective or true or correct principles of morality, principles prohibiting slavery or racial discrimination, for example. Not all of these are immutable principles. What is objectively true, morally, can change over time as circumstances change. And the second natural law claim is that these principles are in some way relevant to understanding the nature of law, including just Kugan's norms, if they're law, as well as being relevant <coughs> to the critical evaluation of legal norms. Now, I note that the report expresses some skepticism about the first claim, the claim that there are objective moral principles. We get the inevitable question, I think put in the mouth of a famous Oxford international lawyer, who determines the content of natural law? Now, I'm inclined to dismiss that question, despite its prestigious provenance, as a category error. The whole point of a proposition being an, an objective moral truth is that it doesn't owe its status to anyone's decision. Slavery, racism, homophobia, etc., are not wrong because someone decided that they're wrong. They're wrong because of all the good reasons that exist for coming to the conclusion that they're wrong. But consider the second claim, the claim that natural law principles help us understand the nature of law, including Juskogen's norms. How might that be possible? Now, I suggest that that's possible in two ways, the second more controversial than the first. First, if use Kogan's norms are human creations, they are not the product of consent. And they're not the product of consent. How should we understand them? Now, I think we should grab hold of a notion that makes a fleeting appearance in Deray's report, 
the notion of consensus, an idea that is different from that of consent. Consensus is an agreement in judgment. A Jus Kogens norm will then arise when, among other conditions, there is a sufficient consensus among states that it merits being a peremptory and non-derogable norm of international law. But now comes the connection with natural law principles. The consensus is on the proposition that there are good moral reasons to subject all states to certain very important non-derogable norms regardless of whether or not they have consented to them. So the very consensus to which Juskogen's norms owe their existence relies on judgments about which standards possess the moral importance needed to make them appropriately legally binding on all states irrespective of consent. Now, of course, judgments of states are fallible and hence may be mistaken. Nonetheless, they are judgments that purport to have the kind of objective basis that is the hallmark of natural law principles. In other words, in order to generate the consensus that leads to Juskogen's principles, states need to do some natural law thinking. So I'm suggesting that legal positivism and natural law so far are complementary. Positivism tells us that Juskogen's is a human creation, in my view, that it's the product of consensus among states. And natural law helps articulate the nature of that consensus. It is a consensus that certain standards have the moral significance needed to justify imposing them through international law on all states, irrespective of their consent, and to make them non-derogable. But of course, the peaceful coexistence and indeed cooperation between legal positivism and natural law may only be temporary. Those attracted to natural law might make the claim that Juskogen's doesn't just depend on the social fact of a consensus, the consensus about which standards have the moral weight to be peremptory norms of Juskogen's, they might go on to make a further claim, a claim that I've made, that whether a norm is a norm of use Kogan's turns not only on whether it's thought to have this moral weight, but whether as a matter of objective moral truth, it actually has this weight. <coughs> if that's so, then discovering use Kogan's norm, norms would not only require you to take note of the moral judgments of states, it would require you, the would-be discoverer of use Kogan's norms, to make a moral judgment of your own. It's not just that states must engage in natural law thinking in generating a consensus. The interpreter or adjudicator of the law will have to engage in some such thinking as well. Now, given time constraints, I have to stop there. But I want to reiterate my appreciation of the fact that this report has the intellectual courage to acknowledge the relevance of theoretical debates and to take a stand on some of the difficult questions that they involve. I welcome that because, in large part, theoretical commitments when addressing an issue like Juskogen's are unavoidable. So it's better to be clear about one's commitments and to defend them rather than to pretend, affecting the manner of a bluff, no-nonsense practitioner, that you are operating in a theory-free zone. And for reasons of litigation, I'm not going to give examples of <laughs> anyone using that technique. I just think that the report would benefit from a more charitable interpretation of the theoretical options made available by both natural law and legal positivism. Thanks, John. Um, and now um, um, may I introduce uh, Dr. Carmen Pavel, um, who's lecturer at the uh, Department of Political Economy, and may I invite her to give her comments. Thanks. Thank you. And I want to add my thanks to um, Diret Ladi for occasioning this conversation and for producing this report, which set in motion the difficult and important work of clarifying the nature of Juskogen's norms. And the fact that the I ILC is taking this up at this time is momentous because Juskogen's norms have been in the background of important conversations about international law such as the authority and immunities of states and states' representatives, the responsibility of states to their own citizens, uh, and the legitimacy of international <coughs> treaties and international legal institutions. The report identifies the four tasks um, that are important to, to um, uh, respond to the nature of Juskogen's, uh, 
uh, the criteria for selecting Yuskoga's norms, an illustrative list, and consequences. And I would like to add some thoughts in the spirit of complementarity to the report about item or task number four. That means the, co the consequences of Yuskoga's norms while emphasizing the importance of an illustrative list. And by consequences, I don't mean legal consequences, but I mean practical political consequences. An illustrative list would likely include prohibitions of some of the most violent crimes that have been declared repeatedly by treaties and conventions to be of a nature that shock the moral conscience of mankind and threaten international <coughs> peace and security a prohibition against slavery, genocide, uh, and crimes against humanity would likely be part of that list. But I want to go now to some of the effects that political scientists have documented. Um, they've, they have documented a number of diffuse and, but important effects of more general human rights norms and treaties. And I think we can be pretty certain that Yuskogan's norm will function in a similar way because they embody human rights pr principles that are considered especially weighty. And these norms are likely to alter the dynamics of domestic and international politics in quite important respects. First, human rights norms, of which Yuskogan's norms are, are an imp especially important category, enable individuals to articulate and make claims against their own governments. Litigation is one such tool, especially when treaties codify human rights norms, and it is one of the best strategies for creating homegrown pro-rights jurisprudence, at least according to Beth Simmons, a political scientist who's been looking at this. So for example, human rights litigation is increasing in Latin American countries with the recent history of hu serious human rights violations and some of that increase can be attributed directly to the impact that human rights treaties have had. Litigation is not the only tool for articulating <coughs> human rights norms at the domestic level. The second function they serve is to empower social mobilization by giving groups focal points around which to organize demands for government reform. International human rights norms both influence the value individuals place on the rights in question and raise the likelihood of success of the movement due to the external legitimation of their demands. Groups that seek to mobilize for reform must translate international norms for local audiences, and when they do so effectively, they galvanize support around a new vision of the individual's relationship to their own government and a new agenda for political change. So for example, advocates for Tibetan rights, including their list of demands, materials, document in the treaties that China has signed and presumably violated. Third, human rights norms, and I include Yuskogan's norms among them, give more power to particular branches of government whose policy goals are in line with such norms. So this would be an exogenous factor influencing domestic policies. And as such, they can change the preferences and priorities of domestic constituencies and their government representatives and shift the agenda in favor of human rights norms. An example that, again, based Simmons uses is that governments that wish to ban the use, for example, of children in armed conflicts can make, a, can make it a higher priority given the Convention on the Rights of the Child's optional protocol relied, relating to children in armed conflicts. And fourth, human rights norms give tools to international actors such as NGOs, other states, and international organizations to pressure, monitor, document, and share information about compliance widely. And these are some of the ways in which human rights norms become alive to individuals around the world. And we should expect Yuskogan's norms to have the same effect. But while we can expect these effects, there's a separate question of whether we should encourage those effects to take place, especially given what David has said about states' uh, various self-interested reasons to perhaps uh, refuse to support the development of Yuskogan's norms. So let me briefly make the case that we should, uh, that is, we should encourage the development of Yuskogan's norms precisely because of these effects that they would have. <coughs> 
and that we should do so despite the resistance of some states, which will be worried precisely about the potential transformative impact on their domestic priorities. One reason is that the non-optional character of Yuskogan's norm will strengthen the legitimacy of international law and its ability to deal with the most serious cases of impunity. One of the most serious weaknesses of international law as it stands, despite its many important gains in recent decades, is that there are no codified laws other than the UN Charter, which bind all nations equally. The strongly consensual character of much international law, with the important exception of customary law, can be complemented with an emphasis on more non-optional, non-derogable rules. Only this way we can move further in the direction of an international rule of law. And while we have reasons to do with the legitimacy and authority of international law to support the development of youth scholars, and especially an illustrative list, we have also reasons based in the minimal requirements of justice. These norms embody the most minimal demands of morality, and as such, they should represent a fundamental commitment of any legal system. Governments regularly and dramatically fail in upholding these minimal demands, and thus fail in their most basic obligations to their own citizens. Governments have committed some of the most horrific abuses against citizens in, in the past century, as documented, for instance, by the fact that more individuals have been killed by their own governments than all of the international wars of the 20th century combined. And international law is often the last resort and the only escape valve for individuals who most often cannot turn back to their abusers for justice. So I have strong reasons of justice to support the articulation and strengthening of Yuskogan's norms. And the first report on Yuskogan's is a big step in the right direction by clarifying and listing some of the most important features of Yuskogan's norms, such as normative superiority, non-derogability, and universal applicability. A next step would be to clarify what kinds of norms might belong to that list. I am too unpersuaded by claims that future reports should shy away from producing an illustrative list because presumably such a list would be misinterpreted as providing a definitive list despite all assurances to the contrary. First, clarity on this issue is of the utmost importance, but beyond providing assurances that this would be an illustrative list and not a definitive one, Neither the reports nor the commission in its broader mission should try to prevent the misinterpretation of its pronouncements. Some states will have incentives to misrepresent, intentionally or unintentionally, such a list. But there will be various mechanisms in place to correct those mis misperceptions. The very, at the very least, the very text of the report. And in any event, trying to preclude all such misinterpretations would be kind of a, like a fool's errand. Second, as the report so carefully details, many states believe that such a list would be valuable in reducing the residual uncertainty about what counts as Yuskogan's norms, and to further describe and prescribe their role in international law. Now, one assurance that future reports could give is that an illustrative list does not have any direct implications on what kinds of legal pathways should be available for their enforcement, or even what legal instrument would best define their role as superior norms of international law. But af after offering such assurances, future reports should take the risky but important step of identifying items on their list, that is, of naming names. Not all that, could do to, that we could do to add to international law counts as progress, but that surely will. Thank you. So before opening the floor to question, could I ask Dira to um, reply or to comment on, on the comments? I won't comment on everything yes. because there was uh, a lot of comments and observations made. So I'll just pick a couple of things. Um, David, you're absolutely right. I think that the question of the, um, the materials um, 
to be used is 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 very problematic for some states and certainly very problematic for the United States. Um, I think one of the um, the comments made in the course of the debate on this topic um, by the representative of the United States was a an observation that the proposal um, uh, has a, and I'm trying to quote here, has a useful um, <coughs> overview of judicial decisions, but very little practice that is referred to. Um, and I guess that might be true. The question is, at least the question for me is, what do we mean when we say practice? Yes, right. uh, and I think practice includes judicial practice. Um, if one looks at the work of the international law, I mean, if one takes a, um, the draft articles uh, on state responsibility, uh, and you look at one of the most successful texts of the International Law Commission, and you go through the draft, um, the draft articles and the commentaries, you find very little of what one might call a narrow view of practice, which is what I think is being called for by you must focus only on practice. Um, the same even with the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, this idea of sort of practice on the ground, I mean, it is mixed mainly based on judicial practice. And I think that uh, um, there's absolutely no reason to sort of depart from this and to make the topic more difficult just simply because it is a sensitive topic. I think we should treat the topic in the same way that the Commission um, um, has treated other topics. Um, the question of the progressive development and, and codification, my view is that the work of the Commission is a is a healthy combination of the two, and it always is. And it's not necessary to make a determination at the end that this is a work of progressive codification, or is this a work of progressive development, or this is a work of, of the the commentaries describe to the reader on what the text is based, and the reader should be able to decipher. Well, this is this doesn't look like law. I mean, if it's based sort of on on lots of writings and and um, um, uh, but very little practice, um, very little hard law, then clearly this is an exercise, that particular provision anyway, uh, would be an exercise of progressive development. What I would, would not want to see for this topic or, in, or for any other topic for that matter is a, a qualifier that the topic is progressive development, um, or that the topic is codification. Because I think very often that would not be an accurate reflection of the project as a whole. And I certainly also would not want to see um, specific provisions being identified, oh, this one is progressive development, this one is codification, as I think happened in um, the last final text that the Commission adopted, um, namely on the expulsion of aliens. Then with respect to the general principles question, which actually comes up twice, and uh, Judge Cansado Trindade's, uh, uh, was it a separate or just, yes, it was a separate opinion in the Park Mills case. I mean, yes, um, the, the initial idea had been that the first report would, would also look at the relationship as a sort of a conceptual issue, the relationship between uh, <coughs> Euskogans and sources, and that's sort of where that kind of discussion about general principles um, and custom international law, which is the other point that you raise. Uh, but by the time I, I had what I had, I thought that the report was already too long. Um, so so it, um, it's probably going to be shelved for further reports. And I think in any event, it would fit, fit well with uh, the criteria for the identification. Because in a sense, once you've made the determination that it is a general principle of law, then whatever it or however you define general principles of law, determine um, the criteria by the same token. Uh, once you've said, well, it's a species of custom international law, then obviously the requirements of custom international law. The, the Vienna Convention, of course, is not silent in that question. I mean, it says that use Kogan's norms are norms of uh, um, uh, norms of general international law. And so the question is, well, what are general international law? Uh, again, I am hesitant to to make, to draw any conclusions without actually having done the work on it. But already intuitively, I would say that um, a norm of Euskogans could be either a general principle of law or a rule of custom international 
um, it's certainly the conclusion that I draw. Um, John, yes, I, <laughs> I, I think I should start off by just uh, um, saying that at the beginning of the theoretical discussion, I, I, and I want to quote here, <clears throat> say that a caveat is necessary here. There is no natural law theory to use Kogan's, just as there is no positive law theory to use Kogan's. There are rather natural law theories and positive law theories. Um, but because of the nature of the report, um, it is obviously a simplification in order to get to the point. I think I should start off by just making that one point. <coughs> that said, I. I also largely agree with your, assuming I understand you, with your conclusion, namely that in a sense, sort of, the two work together, right? Um, and in fact, the report concludes by that. Um, um, and again, I sort of want to just sort of read the last. <clears throat> I think it's. I think it's still paragraph 59. I don't know. Uh, no single theory has yet adequately explained the uniqueness of Uskogans in international law. Um, the peremptoriness of certain obligations. It may even be, as suggested by Koskeniemi, advancing a general theory of sources that the binding and peremptory force of use Kogans is best understood as an interaction between natural law and positivism. Uh, speaking of sources and the natural law positive debate, Koskeniemi states that naturalism needs positivism to manifest its content in an objective fashion, while positivism needs natural law um, in order to, to answer the question, why does behavior, will, or interest create binding obligation? And so and that's, that's the kind of interaction that I think um, um, I'm <coughs> referring to positively. But, right? I mean, but, but I, positivism <coughs> then doesn't mean consent. Uh, right. Absolutely. Right. Um, um, and in fact, the, the um, uh, yes, because the whole problem of positivism is the consent theory. Um, uh, and I'll come back to to um, to the point you make about positivism not necessarily requiring consent. I will. Um, uh, this is reflected in Article Fifty Three. In fact, this interaction, right? So where the the uh, the acceptance and recognition um, isn't the establishment. I mean, right? It's not the creation. It's the recognition. Right? In other words, there is a rule, and, and so this rule exists as a matter of natural law. Um, what what makes it um, or, or, so what give it so what gives it the binding force is the acceptance and the recognition. But the acceptance and the recognition is not constitutive. Right? It's simply sort of declaratory of a, uh, an already existing rule. And I think this is one way in which you can sort of look at the interaction between um, the two. I think that you, again, I accept that a positive law approach does not necessarily, or would not necessarily uh, require consent. It could be um, any form of sort of human creation. Um, <coughs> But I think that for international law, it's, it, this is what makes international law different from domestic law. It's not just any human creation. Any, it is about the will of states. I mean, that's what makes international. That is what makes international law, I think, um, um, different from domestic law. And so, to the extent that um, legal rules are explained. Um, using ideas beyond consent, I think that has to be explained. And that's a weakness of positivism when you um, 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 are trying to, exp to explain the, the, um, uh, the peremptory nature of use Kogan's. Um, Carmen, um, I think with respect to the, uh, the four elements that you identified on the usefulness of sort of clarifying these issues, um, the the enabler um, for claims by individuals, uh, the social mobilization. Um, uh, I think, with the exception maybe of the third one, the influence of domestic policy, and uh, the um, uh, the empowering of NGOs. I mean, I think that's already certainly happening with respect to Ms. Kogan's, and that's 
<coughs> one of the interesting slash exciting things. Um, and I would say that I would sort of view the second and the fourth as one and the same, right? And so the social mobilization uh, along with the, uh, the empowerment of um, um, the NGOs to make certain claims. Um, we are seeing that particularly with respect to uh, mass atrocities and sort of the, 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 um, uh, the call for criminalization. Now, whether or not we should encourage these effects, um, just a small comment I would make is that the, the topic, I mean, the decision of the commission to, to undertake this study um, would not only potentially have the effects of sort of freeing these organs, um, it might also, and I think this is the danger that I, I, I had identified at the beginning, it might also have the effect of restricting it, right? So it might, in fact, I suspect, um, again, here I have to be careful not to uh, receive letters about lawsuits. Um, I suspect that there are some members of the commission that were very supportive of the topic precisely because they want to restrict its impact. Um, so that um, um, you are right, um, but that it, it might in fact have the precise opposite effect of these things. And so it might make it more difficult for individuals to make claims. Uh, particularly one can, if I think back, f if I think for forward four years, uh, and I think what the commission might say about the consequences of use Kogan's, it may very well be likely um, that it doesn't affect, for example, loan immunities, uh, which might have a devastating effect on one of this, this, um, um, the elements that you, uh, you've identified. Great. Thanks a lot. So can I ask the audience if they have any questions? Are there any questions or comments? Yes, please, Tim. Trepidation, although may not sound like it. Uh, <laughs> I'm not a, a lawyer or even a lawyer of any time, but a philosopher like half of the professor. I'm uh, very much agreed with his comments and struggling to understand the concept of, of uh, race programs, which is a little bit unfamiliar to me. I, of course, want to think of it by analogy with something that I am more familiar with. And so I want to suggest this as a, as a template that you might consider. Um, which lays out a certain logical structure, which this uh, 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 um, might, might uh, fit or might not. And this is the role of a consecutive justice, a uh, role of a consecutive justice in relation to the domestic political institutions. That's what you're thinking of it here within the context of the theory of John Rawls. So a set of principles of justice is a standard that, that it has the role of a standard we can refer to to determine uh, whether complaints against the existing uh, legal order or political order are valid and, and it should be changed, or whether the complaints against the order are invalid and, and it, it ought to stand as it is. Um, and so one might think of, uh, th th this is, I haven't said anything about what, what principles of justice are correct, I've just described the concept of the role that, that might play. So uh, um, these projects might be thought of as having that role in relation to the rest of international law. That would explain its peremptory uh, character, just in the very, in the very concept. Um, perhaps it's immutability, I don't know. It, 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 it's, at least it's non-conventional character. And it's, um, uh, perhaps it might even explain its uh, universality. That's a, that's a more complicated argument. I won't, I won't mm. get, get into it. Um, but this concept of justice is CJ. But it has a JC-like uh, feature because it, it sort of can turn water into wine. That is, these are the conditions such that if these conditions are satisfied, then the existence of a certain legal and political order uh, makes it binding. It, it, turns mere, it turns mere existence into, into bindingness. Paul says there's a natural duty to uh, where just institutions exist and apply to you, you must comply, you, you must, you must comply with them. It's not enough that institutions should exist and claim to apply to you. You know, maybe they would be highly unjust and you wouldn't have an obligation. But if they satisfy these principles, these principles, the role of these principles is the principles that 
that, that turns mere existence of the institute as stability, people are generally going along with him, and so on, into, into a kind of a, a, authority. So you, one, one could imagine that you know, Kronstrom play, plays that role in the relation to the rest of natural law, it, it, the rest of international law. It, it sets some, it lays down some markers uh, such that the rest of uh, other customary, customarily established uh, uh, bits of international law, even though the, from the fact that they exist, they also become uh, binding in a way, provided that they that, that they meet the standards of of, of your projects. I don't. I just put this forward as a model yeah. I, for for what the role might be, and then if, if one accepts that as the model of the concept of these projects, then we'll go on and say, well, what conception, what 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 content uh, should principles that can play that role uh, have, uh, and that would be that would be. A particular conception couldn't play that role unless it were to some degree accepted. Uh, so um, it can't function unless it's accepted. Although being accepted doesn't necessarily, as John said, uh, make it make it uh, make it right. We could we could be sort of, sort of, uh, getting it wrong. But I don't know whether that would be a model of the relation between these uh, persons and the rest of and the rest of international law. <coughs> throw, it, throw it out as a as a, a model that's there in the philosophy literature that one could, one could play off of or, or contrast it. I'll just make one further point. I, I, I described it as uh, principles of justice as, as, as laying out sufficient conditions for customarily established institutions to be binding, but there are also necessary conditions. States might be ready, rather happy with the idea of use cogens as a statement of necessary conditions for the rest of international law to be binding, because that gives them an opt-out, <laughs> gives them an opt-out clause. So, so states might be willing to buy into it on the ground that it's protecting them uh, mm -hmm. against overly intrusive uh, things. On the other hand, insofar as they recognize a certain set of, of conditions <coughs> as being conditions such that if, if international law satisfies that, then that's a sufficient condition why the states have to conform. <laughs> that's the, that's the other side of the coin, and they may not. Did not be, be so willing to uh, in, in, in entertain the, the concept of these projects in, in a positive light if they think of us having that aspect. But the principles of justice have both of those aspects, and distinguishing in between them might cast some light on, on uh, the, the reasons that states have for wanting to buy into the whole idea or maybe wanting to resist it. So you'll pardon me for coming in from <laughs> one field with this completely unrelated thing, but I just offer it as, as a model that's been much discussed in another context, and one could ask what, to what degree it applies yeah, thanks. to or doesn't. Thanks a lot, Thierry. Well, um, I mean, I, I guess it could be a model. Um, the, the question, at least in the context of um, this discussion of sort of the theoretical underpinnings, would be, well, uh, to what is a theoretical basis for the justice? Well, that would be the same right. as the ones John mentioned. Right. right. So, 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 so I think as a model, it's, it certainly works, um, but it wouldn't answer that question. Then you'd have to go. Right. So, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. In fact, I think that that's, that's pretty much what Bruce Cogan's data was supposed to do. But, okay. Well, I, I'm just coming yeah. to the answer. I'm asking you, is, is, this, <laughs> is this close to the model that I thought of before, except in a different context or not? <laughs> There's one puzzling feature, though, because what you're describing sounds to me like a concept of legitimacy rather than justice, because it's a condition for laws being binding. And often it's the case that unjust laws are binding, provided they meet certain conditions of legitimacy. So that was the thing that. It's, it's a special condition for being binding. There's a further question about what you do when they are fully fulfilled. So, uh, and and that's, that doesn't leave you completely free. Sure. Uh, but, but it's a further, it's, it's a further question. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, Lorenzo Zucca. Yeah, I think. I wish. <laughs> you can stand up. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> I, uh, I'd like to ask a question about the status of uh, the conclusions uh, you, re you reached in the report. Uh, picking, uh, picking up from a point uh, David uh, uh, raised uh, about uh, well, the conclusions not being like articles uh, and so having a quality of uh, soft law 
Uh, so first of all, I was wondering whether, whether you can comment on that. So, so whether the intention of uh, reaching conclusions rather than articles uh, is to uh, send out there a certain message uh, that is not meant to be uh, law-like, but uh, is meant to be uh, persuasive and uh, informed the <coughs> discussion in such a, in such a way. Uh, the, second, uh, the second point uh, about the conclusions is uh, uh, conclusion two and conclusion three seems to me to be uh, uh, po uh, conflicting uh, or uh, possibly conflicting at times. Uh, uh, you may, you may um, uh, disagree with, uh, with, with this mm. point, but uh, in particular, well, conclu conclusion three, well, which is uh, the much more natural law-oriented type of conclusion, uh, calls for uh, more uh, um, uh, judgment rather than not, in the sense that uh, uh, take, uh, for instance, uh, different uh, uh, use cogens uh, uh, principles uh, uh, that are recognized as uh, hierarchically, hierarchically superior, <coughs> as you said, uh, and imagine that uh, uh, they conflict one with uh, one another. And so I wonder uh, what uh, kind of uh, guidance uh, you give uh, uh, when, it com when it comes to a conflict between different uh, use code principles uh, and uh, whether the conclusions uh, have anything to say or uh, any uh, guidance to provide uh, in such a case. Thank Thanks a lot. Uh, could you hand the over? Thank you very much um, for this. Uh, really interesting presentation and obviously also the comments by the commentators. Just uh, two questions. I, you referred to your last co conclusion uh, referring to fundamental values and I wonder what the meaning of that is for the purposes of, the, of your draft conclusions. And also in terms of the state practice that you have looked at, do states seem to consider these fundamental values as a, an essential component for the formation of use congruence norms? Or is this something coincidental? In other words, can we have a use cogent norms without a reference to fundamental values? That's my first question. If, if I may ask a second Please one. Please ask a second Thank one. Thank you. Um, the, the second question um, is the combination between um, uh, Professor Caron's comment and, of course, your answer, which I, I knew that answer. Uh, but I wonder, I, I knew you, you would give that answer, I mean. But I wonder whether, um, so, you, you said that it is possible to have supercast, so use Coggins to be either supercast or more a super general principle of law. That's fine, it is possible, but I wonder whether it is possible <coughs> to contemplate. What a, was it, sorry? Whether it is possible to contemplate a use Coggins norm which has a formation process completely separate from any dispositive law source. So, uh, can, can I ask uh, Victor Tadros also to ask his question and then we. Do all the three questions. Hello. You go. Even though I, I do work in a law school, I'm almost certainly more ignorant about these matters than Tim. But uh, I thought when it, in these debates between natural law and positivism, we shouldn't see them as working together. We should just disambiguate the questions. So there's a question about what people believe to be non-derogable, and then there's a question about what they morally ought to believe is non-derogable. And then there's a question about when these things coincide. And we just disambiguate the questions. And then if someone says, which of these things are used Kogans? The answer is, tell me a bit more about what the question is, and I'll give you the answer. And then uh, we need not resolve these disputes. There's no real dispute between the natural lawyers and the positivists. It's just that they have different questions in mind when they're asking what it is. And it may turn out that. Lots of people believe that these are non-derogable norms and they're wrong about all of them because actually piracy is okay. <laughs> I mean, that could turn out to be true. And there's still some truth of the matter that everyone believed that they were non-derogable and that it was all very seriously morally wrong and that's why they all believe that. And the same about the consent consensus thing, that someone says, oh, well, there's the things that the states have consented to, and then there's the things that there's consensus about even though they haven't consented to them. And as long as we're clear about which ones we're interested in, we need not resolve which of these things are necessary conditions of something being use Kogan's. We can just avoid that question. So I thought in reports like this, you shouldn't get into these debates. What you should, uh, you should do is just clarify what your question is and then say, other people might have different understandings of what Euclid Kogan's means, but this is what we're focusing on. That would be a good way of 
clarifying and moving on without having to resolve these, what turn out to be primarily terminological disputes between natural lawyers and positivists. Thanks a lot. So, three questions, oh, five, four actually, four <laughs> at least. Mm. So, um, you can pick which ones you answer. I, I know, that's the beauty of it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you have to answer all the questions, I'm sorry. <laughs> so to start off with the status of the conclusions, um, uh, well, I mean, at the moment, they have no status. But once adopted by, by the commission, um, their status is pretty much exactly the same as the status of draft articles. But there is a fundamental difference in the nature of the text, right? So draft articles are drafted as prescriptive, almost like rule, right? And so um, they're the kind of things that you could take exactly as they are and put them in a text and say, that's a convention. Draft conclusions are sort of uh, normative descriptions of what the law looks like now. Right? So, so the difference is not so much in the status, it's just in, if you like, the appearance or their purpose. Whereas draft articles are meant to be rules. They could be rules that reflect the law, and so states shall do this, or you know, this is an obligation on international law, or whatever the case may be. Whereas draft conclusions um, um, cl clarify the law, right? They are normative assertions about what the law looks like. Um, uh, you had a second question um, that flowed from that, which Conflicts. I right, right, right. The question. Well, f first of all, I don't think that there is a that there is a conflict between the draft conclusions. Um, but secondly, I think what you're <coughs> talking about was you're talking about the first paragraph and the the second paragraph of draft conclusion three, and I understand the difficulty because you don't have the text in front of you. Um, I mean, so in a sense, it's a bit unfair. Uh, what draft conclusion three, paragraph two does, and I think this will also go to, to your question, um, um, a little bit, um, is I, it identifies um, some of the characteristics of use Kogan's, right? And so it says, generally, use Kogan's norms look like this. Now, you are right that there is a potential, and this doesn't lie in the draft conclusions. It's just a possibility, just like with any other sets of rules, that you could have a conflict between two norms of use Kogan's. And absolutely, the, com the, uh, the idea behind the project is that at some point, as part of the consequences, the, the commission would look at, well, what happens when there are two norms of use Kogan's that are conflicting? What happens when a norm of use Kogan's conflict with other hierarchically superior <coughs> rules, like, say, Security Council resolutions under Chapter 7, right? So that's something that, that uh, most definitely the, the commission would have to look at, but that would be um, in the context of the consequences um, um, of use Kogan's. Um, what are these fundamental values? Uh, I think this is the question that takes us really to the natural law characteristic of Yuskogen's norms. I mean, if you, if you go through the judgments of various courts, in particular uh, the Inter-American Court, but even if you look at uh, um, um, the International Court of Justice, even prior to the adoption of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, although not using the phrase Yuskogen's in um, the Genocide Convention Advisory Opinion, um, very clearly the, the, uh, um, the court is inspired, if you like, um, in its advisory opinion by this idea of fundamental values of the international community, those values that um, um, the international community um, share. And it's very interesting um, that you, in particular, raise that question, because that's certainly one of the questions that arose about, well, what do you mean by this idea of use? Uh, um, of the fundamental values um, um, of the international community. But I guess the simple answer is it's not me who means it, because it's not me who says it. It is in the jurisprudence. And, and in as much as um, states have said that your, your work or the, um, uh, the work of the special rapporteur, as well as the work of the commission in general, must uh, be based on practice, well, this is based on practice. This is reflected in practice. That is what the practice says, that the that the um, that the um, um, 
um, norms of use Kogan's are, are those that reflect the fundamental values um, among the international community. Um, is, it, is it part of the formulation? Is it necessary for the form? No, I think that, and this is what draft Article 3 is intended to do, is intended to reflect um, the characteristics. So it's not, it's not part of a process of how they're created. It is just once they're created, this is what they look like, if you like. So that's, um, that's sort of how I, how I see that. Um, they, and then your second question, Denai, was about um, the possibility of a uh, norm of use, Kogan's emerging um, outside of the um, normally recognized ways that international law is made. So not um, a custom international law, nor um, a general principle of law. Again, I don't want to say much before actually doing an analysis of something, but intuitively, my answer would be no, right? I mean, it, 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 it is, we define it as um, um, a general principle of law. So it has to be a general principle of law. Um, um, and what are general principles of law? Um, uh, the customary rules of international law and general principles of law recognized by. Um, so, so I don't think that it, that at least intuitively, I don't think that that would be, um, um, that would be a possibility, although I suspect that you may think that it would be. Um, you're right. Ultimately, the, the question is, well, what is the question that you are asking? The question that we are asking here is, what is the theoretical basis for uh, the theoretical basis for the peremptory nature? It's not the theoretical basis for having the rule. It's a theoretical basis for the peremptory nature of the rule. Um, and I think that you, you can actually explain it as a sort of an, I mean, interaction between these two. And there's no reason to, um, to shy away from that. What I do in the report, though, and I have to be very clear, is that I myself do not uh, adopt that approach. Um, I, I, I simply describe it in very positive terms <coughs> that some authors have sort of um, um, described or explained the peremptory nature of international law as this interaction between natural law, so, sorry, the peremptory nature of use Kogan's as this interaction between natural law um, and positive law. I mean, I don't think that there's anything um, that, there's, that there is a, um, uh, I don't think there's anything inappropriate about that. Um, because I think, yeah, yeah. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. I mean, if I one, one question: What rules do people treat as peremptory? Mm -hmm. Another question: What things ought they to treat as peremptory? And a third thing: Which things ought they to treat as peremptory, and do they in fact treat as uh -huh. peremptory? And I don't know which one you're asking. You're right. asking which they do the last treat as peremptory, ought they to treat as peremptory, or do they both treat as peremptory and ought to treat as peremptory? You're actually asking four questions, right? Mm. It's actually the fourth question: <laughs> What rules are peremptory? Right? What rules are peremptory right. and what is the basis for that peremptory? It's not, I'm not asking questions. Um, and in fact, the project is decidedly not about what rules ought to be um, um, or what rules people treat as. That, that, that's not the question of the topic and certainly not the question of this report. The question of the topic would be what rules are peremptory, right? And so it's a statement of fact, what rules are peremptory? Um, Perhaps I, I, I um, and for the purpose of this report, the question then becomes: uh, What is the basis of that peremptoriness? Right? Not what rules are peremptory, but what is the basis of the peremptoriness of whatever rules we eventually determine to be peremptory? Not convinced. So, um, the last question. Um, yes, you want to ask a question? Well, very quickly, I'm not, um, I'm not on the profession, I'm not a philosopher, but I, I've learned so much tonight, but I would like you to touch a little bit on the case uh, in South Africa and for the Sudanese incident and why that's why that relates to its cogents. How is that example? Maybe something concrete. Sure. Sure. Well what the court said was um, I have to say it wasn't the first time that it was considered. The court um, 
um, consider <coughs> in its judgment um, whether or not the peremptory um, nature of the crimes that the Sudanese president is accused of, ha of having committed um, would be sufficient to take away his immunity under international law. Um, and the court essentially decides, I mean, it's, it's very clear that the court, and this is the ought to question, uh, that, the court, that in the court's view, um, it ought to, but that the state of international law currently is that it doesn't, right? And so that notwithstanding the, the, um, the, uh, the peremptory character of um, uh, the crimes or the prohibitions um, that, um, of the crimes that he has committed, um, immunity under international law still remains. That said, the court ultimately decides the question, not on the base of international law, but on the base of domestic law. And of course, it finds that under domestic law, there is no immunity. Um, so there was in that context that the, the question of immunity um, in international law, or the question of use Kogans and its relationship with immunity in international law arose. Great, thanks a lot. That leaves me just to thank the panel, and also invite you to join me in um, thanking Professor Clardy for his talk. Thanks a lot.